In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Why do you have those ashes on your forehead? Why is that something that you do or that some of God's people do? Today marks the beginning of the penitential season that is Lent. And this is the time of the church year during which we focus specifically on the weight of our sin and also what our sin brings us. So these ashes serve as a physical reminder of that hard truth. They are not a means to practice our righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, because in fact, these ashes do the very opposite of that. This black cross on my forehead shows all who see it that I know I am sinful and unclean, and that I also know that my sin will bring about my death. So what are the reasons for the use of ashes, or for the season of Lent, and also for dedicating these coming Wednesday evenings to a closer examination of our Lord's passion and death. Well, first, all of these activities help us remember. And that is an appropriate word for Ash Wednesday, that day on which we receive these ashes on our foreheads and hear the words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Like the deep tolling of a bell, that word remember starts this Lenten season every year. We remember our impending death, and doing so flies in the face of the world's perspective on life. Like that rich man in the Scriptures who had so much that he didn't know where to put it all, who went on to tear down his barns and build bigger ones, the world calls us to do these very things, to take life easy, to get comfortable and to not think about that end we can't avoid. That man said to himself in Jesus' parable, eat, drink, and be merry. But Jesus has a word for this man and for the way that he looks at life. The man he called a fool, and his outlook, foolish. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This warning like the very season of Lent, is an ancient one. And its consolation, however, is likewise ancient. When we remember the death that we deserve to die, we will also be moved to remember the, the death our Lord did die, because His death on the cross took the place of ours. My death, whenever it may be, and Jesus' death are conjoined by God's grace. And when I see my death in His, I can also celebrate the baptismal promise that I will know also a resurrection like His. Another reason for reliving our Lord's passion, as we will in these coming weeks, is so that we might recognize our sin as the cause of death, both our own death and also the death of our Lord. In mirrors, we see ourselves as we really are, what we really look like. Sometimes, however, the most effective mirrors are not the ones that we find over the sink in the bathroom. Instead, they are the people in our lives, because when we sin against them, our sin appears on the suffering of their faces. Their reaction to our sin shows us the result of our very sinful and selfish actions. And to ignore these reflections that we see is both dangerous and foolish. Denying the problem of our sin and how it affects all those around us will solve nothing. Only when we have the courage to fully look upon and acknowledge the evil that we have done will we then be able to begin to find healing. In fact, to deny our sin and its reflection, and we see it in many ways, is only to protect it and preserve it and perpetuate it. So, revisiting our Lord's passion serves also as a mirror for each of us. In the pain and the agony we see, in, we see Him experience through the Mark's gospel account, we see that full consequence of our sin reflected back at us. And the hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, teaches us, 
Ye who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great, here may view its nature rightly, here its guilt may estimate. These ashes on my forehead help me recognize that Jesus' death reflects a selfishness so extreme that by it, as I lived in it, I was turned against God and His perfect love completely. So in Christ's crucifixion, I see a reflection of my rightful punishment, of my sin and its just conclusion. To ignore this or to try to run from it will only lead any one of us into further darkness. And so this mirror serves not only to reflect what is, but it also serves to show what by God's grace can be. When we gaze upon our Lord's crucifixion, we see not only our death, but also our life. In His death, the selfish person that I was and am is also put to death. And in place of my sin, God gives me the very righteousness of Christ. This is known as the great exchange. His innocence and perfection is traded in for our sin and the punishment that we deserve. So examining Christ's passion calls our attention to this wonderful promise. Our next reason for reliving the passion of our Lord is that it provides us with a guide for going forward as His people. Mark's record of these events in our Lord's life is bookended with the promise that, yes, He would die, but also He would be raised from the dead. And after His resurrection, He would go before His disciples to Galilee, that familiar territory. Galilee was the region where Jesus began His earthly ministry. It was in that area that He performed His first miracles, but it is also there that He first faced His opposition. So when He talks about going before His disciples to Galilee, the road He speaks of to us is the road that leads through suffering, death, and resurrection. Therefore, the Passion story becomes a road map for all of Jesus' followers no matter when they are living. It serves as an invitation for each of us to take up our cross and to follow Him. And this is not just a call to discipleship, but it is also a consolation. Here in the Passion account, we see that in taking His way, we meet Him also. He meets us in the waters of holy baptism and from His altar in holy communion. As we walk through the road of His suffering and death, we are pointed to His sacramental promise that He is always with us, even to the end of the age. Through His Word, He speaks to us, and He keeps us on the proper path of daily contrition and repentance, that is, sorrow over and turning away from our sin, looking to Him alone as the only solution to our sin and to the death our sin brings. And still there is one more reason to relive Christ's passion this season of Lent. As we do this, we prepare for joy. And to be clear, joy is not the same as happiness, because happiness lives only where there is no sorrow. When sorrow arrives, that happiness goes away. It cannot stand pain or difficulty. But joy, on the other hand, it rises from sorrow and can withstand even the deepest of grief. Joy, by the grace of God, is the transfiguration of suffering into endurance, and endurance into character, and character into hope, hope that will not disappoint. So in the sorrows of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we examine them this season of Lent, we prepare for Easter and its joy. There can be no resurrection from the dead unless there is first a death. And Christ's rising, then, is the source of our Christian joy. With it, the certain hope of our own resurrection reinforces that joy in this life and also as we go forward under His direction and as we anticipate the next life. This assurance helps us as we acknowledge our sin and the happiness-robbing losses it brings but also as we, as Jesus calls us to, lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
these bodies of ours and the many comforts that we surround ourselves with, they will not last. The ashes on our foreheads tonight remind us and those around us of this truth. So when we look over our own Lord's passion and death, we do see how permanent death seems to be. After his body was taken down from the cross and placed into the tomb, his closest followers thought death had claimed in that moment its greatest victory. But in the midst of their sorrow and their seeming emptiness, he arose and he appeared before them. That which seemed to be the end was not the end at all, but in fact was an incredible new beginning. And it was just as he had told them when he prepared them for all of this before it took place. Speaking to them, he said, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. So may this, these words, be the very pattern by which we, re we revisit our Lord's passion and as we go forward into this season of Lent. Amen. We continue now by singing the offertory on page 192. Please stand. 